you stand with us this morning as we begin to declare the gospel? We'll sing this all together, Come All You Weary. Come on, we sing. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find His mercy, come to the table, He will stand.
out its breath till that stone was moved for good for the lamb he had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs I've been involved with TEN kind of from the beginning. We met Davies through, uh, actually through another contact who directed us to Life Song for Orphans. The first time that our school's assistant director brought this up, I was kind of thinking like I wasn't gonna do it. It came across as if it was kind of a fantasy. I just never believed in coming to the U.S. at all. Kim Miles and the elders from Crossroads Community Church reached out and said, we want you to write an essay of what you see yourself doing in the future. And it was just more about, hey, I wanna, I wanna help people and I'm gonna do it by getting rich. And once I get rich, if I was a chemical engineer, I was gonna work in the mines or something and I'd get a bunch of money. But God was like, no, you have this thing all wrong. But guess what? I want you to start slowly by slowly, start trusting me. Start putting your faith in me so that I'll take you miles. You're just thinking of a few kilometers or something like that, but I want you to see that I can take you beyond 31,000 miles and stuff like that. So I was like, okay, I know my teacher taught me English, but this is nothing like it. So how do I study this? I just want it to be done with. And if this is what you want, Lord, I really don't have to study much because you're gonna provide a way, right? No, God was like, I want you to learn discipline. I want you to be disciplined enough so that you can do your very best with what I give you. I want you to be a steward of what I'm going to provide for you. I want you to learn stewardship in a way that will reflect me and not yourself.
that week, I kind of sat down with uh, my um, assistant director. I was like, what's next? Uh, I was like asking her like, hey, Chris, what's next? I'm done with the exam, right? So this means I'm in, right? And she was like, no, no. In order for you to get to the US, we need a passport. Um, we need a visa. For a student to get a visa, a student visa to come to America, they have to interview at the, at the embassy. And he had to take a six hour trip from where he lived with Lifesong to the capital of, of Zambia, a place called Lusaka. And often they don't get it, they're rejected. I did all my scans and went in, talked to them. Um, they were like, no, I don't think you're getting your stories right. This scholarship does not seem legit. How can somebody pay for everything? Like your school, your flight, all your logistics, your, um, your lodging, uh, that's, that's not right. Maybe this, this is some sort of child trafficking thing. We, we don't think you're getting your stories right, and so we are denying your visa. And that could have been the end of the story, could have been. He was able to get an appointment just a week later, a reappointment. This is really unusual. And the next thing you know, we got, a, we got a, uh, an email from, from Davies with a photograph of Davies uh, celebrating because he had, he had been approved, he got his visa. The next day or the day after, he left with a sponsor from uh, Zambia to LA. And now that I was here, I, I, I kept asking myself, hey, okay, this is not a dream. I pinched myself a little bit and, and walked out and there was Kim and Brenda Miles welcoming us and with, with a poster that said, my send, my language word for welcome. So being able to study at the master's university is actually something I, I just didn't think about possible. You know, we're blessed at master's with uh, international students. Those students enhance our education by educating us. And so what became evident right away is his insights into the lecture topic. Not only was I receiving a really, really solid theological foundation, but I was receiving all those professors who were just like so good at communicating what they had mastered. He was a kind of student that would ask the question that others wouldn't think of. There was a depth to it, and, and I knew it just became evident he was gifted. He was gifted. It is something that I believe that you can only explain through through how he was created. And you know, how he was created to have this mind and the insights and the natural gift to see these, these specific chemistry insights in biology. What we're finding in distant lands uh, that haven't, that are still struggling with their economy is how do we deliver medicines? How do we make them? How do we deliver? Part of it is just getting the right medicine to the right place. And Davies wants to, he wants to help those connections between getting help to his, to the people there, bringing the gospel there, um, but ma making a difference for Christ with the gospel in his heart with, and living it out in front of us. The moment I left Lusaka, I knew I was leaving something behind, something that had been so essential to me, my family. God and Jesus Christ were just like telling me, hey, you're not alone. We're, we're not going to keep you in California alone. God was, was, was uprooting my family from Zambia, putting them on a plane and just like dropping them in California in different spots and saying, hey, the same, the same hearts that you left back home are the same hearts I'm going to implant in these people. And I know in his first couple of years, he shared meals and, and spent time with the Kirshner family, with the Skikases. I know that had a huge impact on him. We had the space and we just thought, you know what, maybe it's time just to get out of the comfort zone and it'd be great for our kids to get to know someone from a different, another culture and to learn, you know, how to serve and what that's like and what hospitality is like. So yeah, we took the jump. They filled in this role that my biological mom was supposed to if I was home. And so they made it easy for me to feel at home. I think that by 
you know, actually participating in where we have somebody in our house, it, it just means much more than just giving money away. We, you know, Davies is now a part of our family. Just such an encouragement to see how we trust in the Lord every single day and how God has just opened doors for his future and um, provided for him. And that, that's beautiful. That's, that's like the beauty of what God slowly, slowly, slowly was, was, was saying to me, hey, I'm, I'm not gonna give you an orphan. I'm gonna give you a church. I'm gonna give you families. I'm gonna give you so much that you have little to do with. I feel like I have another son, you know? No, it's just been, it's made the 10 experience for us, I think, so much more personal. I'd always wanted to sort of adopt, but we just never had the chance to do it. I think that we got a little chance to, to again, the Lord brought someone to us that we could really impart our wisdom, our experiences, our love into mm -hmm. so. Four years ago, I would not imagine what sitting here would be like with a bachelor's degree in biology, pursuing a career in research. That means I would have to go for either a PhD or MD-PhD, but somebody in the Crossroads Community Church, reached out to another doctor. He had a friend named Fred Sattler who was coming to Crossroads. And it turns out he's not only a doctor, he's a very accomplished doctor in the area of infectious disease research, which just happens to be what Davies uh, desires to do. He connected Davies with a fellow named Mike Sag. Well, Dr. Sag is at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. and. Not only is Dr. Sag involved in medical research, he oversees the research labs that the University of Alabama Birmingham has, including one that's in Zambia. Immediately after they had finished talking, the doctor from UAB reached out and said, hey, um, let's have a Zoom call. And I was like, that's cool. This person has like three pages of credentials. Uh, I was like, so marveled at how much this doctor had done. He owns a research facility in Zambia through UAB. And that was so perfect. I was like, God saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to find a connection for you. A connection that will make sense for you to actually transition from just being a college student in the US to actually being a researcher one day in Zambia at a facility that I'm going to press you at. But I want you to carefully follow my steps. I want you to pursue this internship. And so I did. What ended up happening is three months later, I got an interview with a lab at QAB. But not only did I did I come across this internship, a marvelous thing happened. The Lord put it in my heart to propose to my longtime girlfriend, and she said yes. And I was so excited because not only do I get to start a new internship, but I'll get to start a life and mirror the relationship of a married life on all these families that I had come across to all the lessons that are learned through living with different families are going to then manifest themselves as I go into my new marital union with my wife. It's amazing to, to think about what may happen, the impact that Davies may have. We just don't know. This is, uh, Davies could find a cure for a disease or, or who knows what he's gonna do uh, with the education that he's got and with the doors that are opening for him. And that is, that is what I look forward to doing. That is what I pray, I pray is my purpose on earth. I'll be able to reach many souls with the truth that I've learned from both Crossroads and Masters and be able to reach out to a very diverse community of patients. And that's my goal and that's what the future looks like. Well, Crossroads Community Church, would you welcome a, a graduate of the Masters University, Davies Kalange. And what, a, what an incredible story of God's sovereign providence. Uh, his fingerprints have been all over this story from day one. 
For those of you that are new to our church, this is what we call our 10 ministry. Some of you were handed a brochure when you walked in. Explains uh, what 10 is on one side, and then on the, on the other side, it explains just the story and narrative of uh, uh, Davies uh, Kalange. And so uh, uh, Davies has been part of our family for the last uh, four years, and uh, he's off to a new future, and I'm going to let him uh, tell you all about this. But this 10 ministry is all about us uh, finding, by God's providence, a uh, orphan around the world who can meet the requirements to come and to attend the master's university, get a world-class education with a biblical foundation, and then be able to send them back uh, to uh, their home country and for all that God has in store for them. And so Davies, uh, Davies is our first graduate of the university. And so uh, this morning, Davies, uh, would you just share, uh, tell us, we kind of got the story, but give us like the the latest and greatest, what on earth are you doing now, all right? So tell us that and something about this marriage thing. What are you thinking? And, uh, uh, so bring us up to speed. Yeah, uh, but before I even say that, I just want to say thank you so much uh, for the past four years that I've been here. You've been so welcoming and just being able to talk to you has been amazing. Um, this is a very really good church, grass-centered church, and I love that about this church. Um, uh, but what am I doing? So my job is simple, right? My boss tells me what to do, and I do it, <laughs> like all of us, right? Um, uh, but I'm doing research at UAB, uh, and my research is in vivo research, which just means um, it, it's more lifelike. We, we do a lot of things that just discover the next uh, cures and stuff like that, uh, mainly with vaccines and, yes, vaccines. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then, yeah, that's pretty much my work. Uh, I'm learning a lot of um, equipments right now because I'm super new to that side of the field. And I uh, just hope to learn more and hopefully go to pursue a MD, PhD uh, so I can translate from like mouse models to human beings. Uh, that means medicines made with mouse to human beings. Uh, that's what I'm doing and that's what I hope to do. And I think my uh, fiance's name is Hannah, and we met in Zambia um, about three months before I came to the US. And we were friends for the whole year of 2018 and 2019, we started dating. And 2021, August 9th, we got engaged on our second year anniversary. So yeah, and we hope to go back to Zambia together. She was uh, an intern at... Um, Life song where I was going, um, and she loves mentions, and I love mentions, and so the Lord was like, "Hey, here is a match for you." <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. That's pretty much what I'm doing, and that's what the future looks like, and it's in God's hands. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, and um, the story is amazing in that as you followed uh, what was shared uh, on video there. Uh, University of Alabama actually has a, a research facility, guess where? In Zambia, his home country. And, uh, and so he's going to further his education, and Lord willing, he and Hannah uh, will serve the Lord. Um, and, and I really believe this. I think, I think God has put his hand on Davies, and uh, we're going to hear about him in the future of doing something not only uh, great for uh, society and culture and humanity, but also for the cause of the uh, gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we, we get to participate in that, and we are so grateful that the Lord allowed us to participate in that. And uh, I want to do a quick thank you. Thank you to the Ski Kisses. Thank you to the Kirshner family. Uh, thank you to the Coleman family uh, for playing kind of the hands-on role of, of caring for Davies while, while he's been a college student here. Uh, and then I also want to give a thank you, and would you thank uh, Kim Miles, who's our director of 10 Ministry. <laughs> And um, Kim has the, the, um, the task of uh, searching the globe, trying to identify uh, students that would qualify to come here and study. And so the great news is Kim has identified uh, three uh, candidates that have already submitted their applications uh, for this next fall. So be praying for us as we 
work through as they work through, just like Davies had to. And we obviously have Lena, who's part of our, our church now, and she's in process, second year at the university. And we're so thankful for that we get to be part of this thing called the uh, 10 Initiative. And uh, I, I invite you, if you've never participated, uh, participate with us because this is the product. This is what happens uh, if everybody in this room gave up a Starbucks once a week Five bucks a week, yeah, if you gave up five bucks a week, we can keep doing uh, what we're doing here with uh, Davey. So if you haven't joined us, uh, take a look at the website and join with us. Uh, I'm going to ask if we can, we're going to, in many ways, we're sending Davey's off. He's graduated. He graduated early. I mean, who does that, right? Um, And, uh, you know, most of us cram four years of college into six years, and... uh, and he, he finished a whole semester early, and so he's getting married in May uh, and is already working back uh, there in Alabama and flew out just for this weekend. So let's pray for him. I'm going to ask Kim Miles to pray, uh, pray for Davies and pray for his future as we uh, send him off to all that the Lord has. Dear Father, uh, we rejoice this morning and, uh, with Davies, and, and we... Uh, uh, we just acknowledge, as Todd has said, that uh, we, we give you the glory because none of this would have happened uh, without your hand on things. So you, no way the meetings and the connections and the, uh, the doors that have opened, uh, the people that have come into Davy's life, there's no, no way that anyone can look at that and, and fail to acknowledge that uh, it's you that, that did that. And so we thank you for that. As we look ahead uh, now, as, as Davies continues down the, this, uh, this path that you've got him on, um, your word says that um, the man that delights in you, that you grant the desires of their heart. And, and I pray that uh, Davies will just keep his eyes on you. I uh, pray that you'd bless his marriage that's upcoming. We pray that uh, he would just keep you the center of everything that he does, his marriage and his career plans as he prepares uh, to apply for med school, takes the MCAT, uh, goes through all that. I just pray that every day he will get up in the morning and uh, pray to be led by your spirit and, and to walk by your Holy Spirit. And I really believe that if he does that, that you will just continue to bless him, that he has a, an incredible future. We, we're so excited to uh, just to share in, in this experience with him, and we look forward to hearing more uh, about what happens. Uh, we just can't wait. So we just commit him to you. We trust you for his future. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goats, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Well, good morning once again to you. It's great to see you all here, especially on Daylight Savings Time. Uh, it just, you know, don't be depressed about it. Just think um, Jesus will come back one hour earlier <laughs> until fall, and then, and then it will go back again. Uh, but right now we're on the positive side. So great to see all of you. 
Um, we uh, were excited to have uh, Davies here this weekend, and as a, a final note on that, Davies will be in the lobby after service, and we would love for everybody to go by and just love on him as we send him off, but you'll see a place uh, out in the lobby that he'll be, and you can, you can greet him there. Uh, yesterday, uh, my uh, precious wife and I celebrated 34 years of marriage, and uh, yeah, um, she, she's enjoyed all 30 years, and uh, um, but we are uh, very thankful. There's not, a, there's not a, a woman on the planet that I would rather be around than my precious wife, Stacy. I plan to chase her around the hall of heaven uh, for all of eternity, and uh, she's not here this morning. Her father actually had a stroke this week, and uh, she's uh, over there caring for him. He's going to be okay, but there's just some care that's needed today. So uh, with that, you can let her know that I love her, okay, and uh, that I said something about our anniversary. Well, do this. Grab your Bibles um, and turn with me to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. This morning, we're going to talk about government. Yeah. Some of you are like, and I got up early for this, right, right, right? Um, well, um, I preached on Thursday night. I was kind of fired up. And um, Thursday, you should come Thursday nights because you get the raw Todd. And, um, and that sometimes that's not always the best. And after I was done preaching, my son texted me and said, Dad, your sermon needs a lot of work. <laughs> and um, he sent me a whole text of, uh, the good news is my son was listening. And, um, and he sent me a whole thing because I was, I was kind of shooting from the hip. And so I'm going to try to restrain myself, but probably won't be able to. Uh, so you'll get some of that, but know that, um, know that I'm trying to adhere to his admonitions, all right? Uh, let's pray, and, uh, and then let's talk about government. Father, we, we uh, pray. We pray for our hearts and our minds this morning. You would help us to drink uh, deeply from your word. Father, help us to understand the role, responsibility of government. Uh, Father, we all wrestle with it at times, and it seems more recently that it wrestles with us. And um, that's not always easy, that um, Father can bring out the worst in us as, as Christ followers. I, I pray, Lord, that you would help us uh, to remember your word and the fact that you have established governmental authority, and help us, help us to uh, rest on that truth. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ, amen. I sense most people do not like being told what to do. Let's start with a question and raise your hand if you, if you don't like being told what to do. The rest of you aren't raising your hand because you don't like being told what to do. <laughs> As one person has put it, I can submit to anything except authority. Um, a submissive man or a submissive woman today stands out like a flagpole in the community. And as Christ followers, we're called to stand out like a flagpole in the community. We are the light of the world. We are the testimony and the expression of, of Christ. We are the church. We are a blood-bought body who's called here to be the salt and the, and, and the light of the world. And, and we've got to remember that uh, Scripture speaks to this issue of government. In fact, it was Paul himself that wrote in Romans 13, probably the most direct treatise on government role, and in Romans 13, verse 1, just listen to what he said. He says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from those that exist have been instituted by God, by God. That the government uh, that we uh, serve under and the governments around the world have been instituted by God himself. So the question that we have before us today that is almost palpable on all of our hearts and minds is this whole idea of this Russian-Ukrainian war. And the question becomes, what does a Christian Russian soldier do today? What does a Christian-Ukrainian soldier do today? Well, you say, well, that's not necessarily a fair question in light of Romans 13 because Paul was writing when there were some fairly decent kings. Oh, not so fast, Batman. That really was not the case at all. In fact, when he wrote Romans 13, the king at that time was Nero. Let me just tell you, he was a sight case. He was, he was, he was a crazed individual. Oh, Nero himself, he was the one who killed his own mom. And then Nero is the one that put Paul to death. 
Romans 13 writer, Nero, the king, who Paul says we are to submit to every governing authority. You see, over the course of human history, Christians have lived under evil leaders most of the time. The last 250 years here in America has been the rare exception for this rare experiment that we're in called the United States. But what does the Christ follower do when they're under evil leadership? I'm not necessarily talking about leadership that you disagree with. I'm talking about evil leadership, wicked leadership. What do you do? Sometimes uh, leadership comes in glowing, and it looks, it looks like that is the perfect person for such a time as this, and then all of a sudden they change as, as their government goes on. One national leader stood before his country, and he stood before uh, uh, the men and women of his country, and he said this, the national government will regard it as its first and foremost duty to revive in the nation the spirit of unity and cooperation. It will preserve and defend those basic principles on which our nation has been built. It regards Christianity as the foundation of our national morality and the family as the basis of national life. Turbulent instincts must be replaced by national discipline as the guiding principle of our national life. All those institutions which are the strongholds of the energy and vitality of our nation will be taken under the special care of the government. Now, this sounds pretty good on on the surface for sure. In fact, most of us would like to live under this type of government, yet this speech was delivered on February 1st, 1933 to the German people by their new chancellor, Adolf Hitler. The strongholds of Christianity. So what do you do when a rogue regime goes south on you? What do the people of God do when it comes to government, whether it is good or whether it is evil? Well, let's start with the basics. This morning in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, there's only one foundational point. Sometimes I have no points. Sometimes I have three points. Last week I had 18. Today there's just one point. And it basically is, is, is just woven through chapter 8 because chapter 8 is all about governmental authority. The first point you're going to see, and this is where we're going to start. We're going to start with the foundation. We're not going to start with a particular government. We're going to start with the foundation that Solomon lays out. And if anybody understood how people should operate inside of a government, it's Solomon, for his name is King Solomon. And so he's establishing the uh, understanding for the people of God to operate under this thing called government. This is the theme of chapter 8. Governmental authority, hear me on this, governmental authority is established by God. Governmental authority is established by God. Let's, Let's just see the first four verses as he lays this theme out. Verse 1, who is like the wise? Remember, he's chasing wisdom. A man who's been given a double portion by God himself is all about wisdom. Who is like the wise and who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine and the hardness of his face is changed. Don't you love that? Uh, Ladies, instead of cosmetics, get wisdom. Why? Because it makes your face shine. It, it, changes, it changes the hardness of a face. Wisdom shows up on the face of mankind. Notice what he says, verse 2. I say, here it is, keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. Keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. Be not hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. For the word of the king is, what's that word? What's that word, church? Supreme. And who may say to him, what are you doing? (laughs) Solomon's been on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. You see, you see, this is the foundational point. Of, of King Solomon. This is the foundation of Ecclesiastes 8, that governmental authority is established by God. He even says, keep the king's command. Obey, obey the government, obey the king. Literally in the Hebrew, it says this, keep the mouth of the king. 
Keep the mouth of the king. Obey government. Rightful authority is to be obeyed. Why is it to be obeyed? Notice what he says. is because of God's oath to him. You see, in, in, in those days, a king would take an oath before God himself. And, and, and God would, put, would, would, would establish the authority of that government. And, and, and many times, the, the king and the people would take an oath together. And what's he saying here is because God has established the king. In other words, God has put him in that place. And, and there's, a, there's an allegiance that you and I take the oath with him. Therefore, we are to obey him. Uh, in many ways, it's like our pledge of allegiance. We don't have a king. The government is by the people for the people. But we, we pledge our allegiance to, the, to the, the concept, the experiment of the, of the United States of America. We're committed to obey the laws of the land. That's what the people have agreed to in our country. And he says, I want you to know something, that God has established, God has ordained human leaders and governments. What does that mean? Simply this. Even an unjust government is better than no government at all. Did you hear that? Dr. Mueller said this the other night. An un, even an unjust government is better than no government at all. You say, how can you say that? Why? Because the worst thing for any society is chaos and anarchy. Make no mistake, if chaos and anarchy reigns, somebody will assume the power of authority. It happens every day all around the world. When there is a vacuum, there is, uh, there is no existence of human authority, some human will usurp the authority, and it's usually at the detriment of the people. So, so God has established government as a grace gift to humanity because he knew we were fallen creatures, and therefore we needed restraint. We needed, we needed authority over our lives. We've seen this, that we, when you remove authority, what you get is chaos and anarchy. We've seen this the past year and a half. Cities aflame, craziness. We have retailers that won't open up stores in places like Seattle because they can't afford the theft that happens in those places right now. And so that's why you come back to, you come back to this fact that God has ordained human leaders and governments. Now, you're looking at me funny, but you always do. But, but I want you to turn with me to the book of Romans as quick as you can because I don't want you to hear from me. My words mean nothing. God's words mean everything. And I want you to see this in a few passages. Romans chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Let me read. I read the first verse. Let me reread that plus all the way through verse 7. Paul writes this, let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed and those who, who resist will incur judgment for rulers are not terror to good conduct but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval. For he is, watch this, hear this, he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant, you hear this? He's the servant of God and an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Loved ones, the Bible never ever preaches defund the police. The Bible preaches, we esteem those in authority. They are a grace gift to us. Imperfect as they are, they are still God's establishment to, to bear the sword, to carry the, carry the authority, authority. And Christ followers should be the first in front to support those in law enforcement, those in, that sit in jury boxes, those that sit on judges' seat, those that are in places of government, we support those in authority. That's the Bible. Now, hold on. You, you're not going to clap. For, I'm going to tick everybody off in this room, so don't <laughs> clap yet, okay? Because you're going to be really angry with me at some point. Now, we go on. <laughs> Forget what my son said. Here we go. Therefore... <laughs> Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, 
but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, <laughs> for because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of who? God. Ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. You're, thinking, you're like, <laughs> taxes, respect, honor. Is there another? Is there another passage we could look at? Yeah, there is. Let's go to Titus. Let's go to Titus. Maybe we could find something better about taxes than Titus. Titus. Let's go find, let's go find Titus. Titus chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Let's see what Paul says to this, to this church that's being set in order. Here's what he says. Remind them, verse 1, to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work a church that was extremely organizationally, administratively a disaster. What does he say? Remind, remind them to respect those in authority. And you're thinking, come on, let's, let's find a different one. Let's find one more. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and see if maybe, maybe Paul's a little bit looser on this one. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. You still with me? Verse, two, verse 1. He says, first of all then. You know what that, you know what that means? First of all. In other words, he's done an introduction in chapter one, and now he says, now I want to tell you something. And the first thing I want to tell you, remember, first things are of first importance. And here's Paul writing to this young pastor there in Ephesus, and here's what the first thing he wants to tell them. First thing he says right out of the gate. First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Stop there, turn back to Ecclesiastes 8. What's he saying there to young Timothy? He says, the goal of our instruction, what we're trying to do is we just want to live, we want to live just a peaceful and quiet life. Why, why, why? Because we're all about the cause of the gospel. We're all here on the planet for one mission, and that is to make much of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we need is just tr tranquility and peace and order. And we as a church are thankful for the men and women that stand every day between us and anarchy, us and chaos, and bring tranquility and, and peace to our neighborhoods. Why? Why? Not so, not so that, that we can all become Republicans. That's not the goal, Paul says. Paul didn't say, first of all, of all importance, get on Fox News. First of all, of all importance, let me just tell you what you want to do. You want to pray for those in authority. Why? Because you want a tranquil life. You want a peaceful life so you can make much of the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that's, our, that's our goal. That's our purpose. Francis Schaeffer, an apologist, in the, in the 20th century, who wrote extensively on this subject. Here's what he says. I love this. He says, now, while non-believers obey the state for no reason except that the state has guns and has, has the patronage, he says, Christians, on the other hand, are to obey because the Bible tells us that God commanded us to obey the state. We have a higher purpose than the fact that they bear a sword. Our purpose is to surrender and submit to authority because God has called us to do this. God has called us to actively practice this. And so when you get pulled over on the freeway by that CHP officer like Pastor Todd for being on your phone, <laughs> guess what you do? You treat him with respect. You treat him with honor. You speak well of him. Why? Because, because he's doing the work of God. And we want to live a, tr a very tranquil life, a peaceful life, so we can make much of Jesus Christ. So that's why he says, number one, show him respect. Notice, notice in the verse where the respect is, notice what he says, when you're in the king's presence, be not hasty to go from his presence. What, what does that mean? 
Well, in that day, when you were in the king's presence, much like if you were in the queen's presence today in England, whenever you leave the room, you don't just turn your back on the king or the queen and walk out, see you later. No, you, you, you stand there and out of, here's the word, out of respect, you step backwards. And this is how you walk out of the presence of a king or queen. It's the idea in that day, in England, in that way, to show respect. The principle uh, translates into our culture today. We treat, we treat those in authority with respect. Notice this. He, he even says, now, don't plot against him. In other words, he says, do not take your stand in evil. He says right there in the verse. Don't, 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 take, up, don't take up rebellion. Don't take up insurrection. He says, don't plot against the king. You treat him with respect and you obey the king. And let me make a comment on this. Let me just tell you, all rioting in the U.S. is sinful. Protesting is our right. But rioting where you are an affront to law enforcement officers, whether it be January 6th or whether it be in the streets of cities across America, you burn, destroy, and affront those in authority over you, you are in sin and you must bear the judgment. Everybody must, no matter what side, side of the aisle you're on. You obey those in authority. They, those that do not should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Why? Because God has placed them there. It's God's oath to him. He, the king has rightful authority. Why? Because he says the word of the king is what? Supreme. This is God speaking through Solomon. The, the, the king has final authority over us. So now let's unpack this point. First four, views, four verses is the foundation. Now some of you are like, well, yeah, but, 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 but what about, but what about, but what about? I know you butter well people. I run across you, but what about people all the time? But what about, okay, we're going to answer some of the but what abouts, okay? Under the first point, write, write this down. Government must be assessed. Government must be assessed. It must be observed. It must be held in check. Uh, there, there, there must be wisdom applied. Why? Look at verses 5 and 6. He says this, whoever keeps, keeps a command will know no evil thing. Is that not a true point or what? You obey the law, guess what? You're going you're, you're, you're gonna, to you're gonna keep yourself out of harm's way. You're not going to endure evil things. You just, you're obedient. You leave that, that quiet and tranquil life. And now watch, he says this. And the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. For there is a time and a way for what? Everything. Although man's trouble lies heavy on him. What's he saying here? He says, there is a time, there is a proper time, and there is a proper way to stand up to government. There is a, a proper time and a proper way to stand up to government. And wisdom, at those moments in time, wisdom is desperately needed in the crucible of a decision to defy governmental authority. If there's ever a time that wisdom is needed, it's needed at that time. So why would we defy? Why would we defy what would be the proper time and what would be the just way? Well, Francis Schaeffer, once again, an apologist from the 20th century, wrote extensively on this. And he suggests these in order. He says the way to first, the first way to voice your opposition to something the government is doing, number one, he says this, you need to vote. Okay, so this, this, is, this is from Francis Schaeffer. It's not, for, it's not order of authority from the scriptures, but this is a wise, godly man who's written extensively on this. Number one, uh, we need to, what do we need to do, Christian? What do we need to do? Why, why aren't you voting? That, that's my question. Why aren't you voting? Because a lot of us in this room aren't voting. And I want to say to you, you need to get out and you need to vote. You need to vote biblically. You need to vote according to the scriptures. You, you need to vote, vote righteously. You need to vote. It's our first ability to affect government. Second way, he says, the next, the second way, and this is in, in descending order. The first way, vote. Then the second way is legal recourse. 
In other words, if the government is causing you to do or act in a certain way, do you in your land have legal recourse to bring accountability to somebody in authority over you that's causing you or wanting you to, to do something that is wrong? Do you have legal recourse? Vote, legal recourse. Number three, number three, he says this, protest here in America. America. We are, by our Constitution, we have the right to protest. We don't have the right to riot. We have the right to protest. It's a beautiful right. And, and I mean, there's nothing wrong with that right. We should, we should protest at times where the government is going awry. When they're saying a baby in a womb is not a baby, we protest that. Because that's not the case. The, the, the fourth thing, vote, legal resource, protest. The fourth thing is flee. Flee, he says. As a Christ follower, if you're in a situation where the government is coming down on you, man, if you can, if they're causing you to do something that is sinful, wrong, or evil, man, can you get it? Just get out of there. Can you get out from under it? He says, flee. And then uh, fifth and final, he says, when the government's asking you to do something, not that you just disagree with because of your political bent, but because it's sinful, it's against Scripture. What does he say? Then the last, the last option is use force to defend yourself. What's he talking about? He's talking about, he's, he's talking about a proper way to us for a government to be assessed. This is the secret sauce. This is being like Daniel. And what Solomon says is in, at those times, you and I need the wisdom of God, when to speak and when to be silent. Because why? Because we want to say the right thing at the right time. This is what Daniel did, right? You remember we went through the book of Daniel? Oh, my goodness. You remember we went through the book of Daniel? Yeah. Guess what? Daniel, Daniel obeyed the king up until a point. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They obeyed the king up until a point. And then they said, we will not bow. We will not bend the knee. We can't do that. And they encouraged, they encouraged the judgment of the, of the king. Christians are obedient. That's our nature. We obey the laws. We obey the laws of the land up until they would cause us to violate Scripture. That's Acts chapter 5, right? Remember Peter? Peter's preaching. He's preaching. Understand the, the situation in Acts 5. He's preaching just... I mean, just a matter of 40-plus days after Jesus was crucified for the gospel, in essence. Now Peter gets up right in the same town, in the same street, and starts preaching the gospel. And remember what happened? A big riot. Everybody's getting upset. The authorities come, and they tell him, you got to stop preaching. What does Peter say to him? We must, we must obey God rather than man. See, someday I'm going to stand, at the end of my life, I'm going to stand not before the President of the United States, but I'm going to stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And it's to him I have to give an account. So I, I, I'm like Schaefer, man, we're going to do everything we can to, 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 to mitigate a rogue government. And again, I... Understand, there's, there's a big difference between I disagree the politics of this versus this king is asking me to violate Scripture. And we, 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 you have to separate those. In some ways, that was the point that the elders of this church came to during the COVID thing, that after we understood the nature of the virus and what it is and what it isn't, we decided we're not going to tell people they have to come to church but we felt compelled by the scriptures, we have to open up the church for those that want to assemble, according to Hebrews 10, that want to worship together. We don't want to force people to come, but we feel compelled to open up and say you can come worship corporately together. Why? Because there was a point in time where we said, we've got to do this. We obey God rather than man. <clears throat> number number. Number two, letter B, government has, government has limited authority. Let me say this. Government is not God. And I, I want you to hear me on this. Government, God keeps rogue regimes on tight leashes. He really does. Notice, notice starting in verse 7. He says, for who does not know what is to be? For who can tell him how it will be? 
In other words, the king doesn't know everything. He's not all-knowing. He's not, he's not all-sovereign. He, he's not, he, not all-powerful. He doesn't know the future. God is the only one who knows the future. Why? Because he, he lives in the future. Why? Because he lives outside of time. He sees future, present, and past all at the same time. So the king, the king doesn't know everything. The government it doesn't know everything. Verse 8, no man has power to retain the spirit. What is this? You, 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 you don't understand that no government, no government can keep you from dying. Did you know that? There, there is no governmental solution for death. I looked it up in Wikipedia. There is no law that can be passed. There, there's no, there no amendment to the Constitution that's going to keep you alive. The government can't, doesn't have that power. Or power over the day of death goes on. There is no discharge from war, nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it. Let me just tell you something. A corrupt government will be held account. Verse 9, all this I observe while I apply my heart to all that is done under the sun. When man had power over man to his hurt. How does man hurt man? Well, there is governmental abuse of power. We see that all around the world. We see the pompous potentate Putin who's hurting man to man's hurt because of his quote-unquote position. We see, this, we see this day in and day out, the, the abuse. We see, we see in America where judges are legalizing sin. I mean, we're, we're not talking about that America's practicing sin. We have the highest forms of government now that are legalizing it and penalizing those that don't actually practice it or praise it. We, 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 we live in a time when, 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 when all of a sudden there is an abuse of power that's going on, and Solomon is saying, I want you to understand that government has limited authority. They have no control over the day of death. They have no sovereign control over your life. They have no sovereign control over when God says, it's over, it's over. Only God holds that. Remember Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, verse 21? Daniel says that God changes the seasons and the times. You know who says spring? God says spring. Not some date on the calendar. It's when God says spring, guess what we do? We spring. And then he says this, listen, listen. He says not only does he change the times and seasons, but he removes kings and he sets up kings. Yes, he does. You say, well, whoa, 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 wait a minute, you don't understand. There's, there's this king. This king has all this authority. Yeah, you're right, but Jesus is the king of kings. Daniel, Daniel remember the king said to Daniel, well, yeah, hey, I remember, I'm, I'm the high authority. And Daniel says, yeah, but I serve the most high. And if I, I love to say this. Someday, 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 every, every person that has ever served on the Supreme Court will make an appearance in the Supreme Court and will be accountable for every decision that they've made. And governments are high, but God is most high. Remember what, remember what Proverbs, Proverbs 21.1 says, the heart of the king is like a, stream, like a stream of water, like a river of water in the hands of God, and he turns it any way he wants. Do you know that, do you know that God Almighty is running Putin like a puppet? He's like a marionette, and God just is pulling the strings on the, on the, on the sucker. He moves, he moves the heart where, well, but it's horrible things. I understand. As Johnny says, God, God allows what he hates to accomplish what he loves. What's the outcome of this war? I have no idea, but there is an outcome because God is marching all things according to his eternal decree. All things. And you need to know something. When, 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 when God says the war's over, make no mistake, doesn't matter what Putin says, the war's over. He runs, a, he, ru, he, runs those, he runs those people like, like puppets. Let me tell you, he has, he has Biden on puppet strings. And you may, you may think, oh, the election was, sto was stolen. Let me just tell you, a sovereign God selected. Really? Really? You really believe? I, yeah. He's sovereign over everything. He's sovereign over everything. God is in control of everything. There's, not, there's nothing out of step. Ah, 
the world's coming apart. No, it's really, no, it, it's actually very much in control. It's moving a con, a, along according to God's plan. That's how we as Christians need to think. We, we shouldn't, our, our hearts shouldn't rise and fall every four years. Is that we understand that the government has no authority over our lives to, to take our life to end our, It's when God says. You mean people that die in war, it's according, it's according to the numbers that God has given to them? Yes, it is. He's numbered our days before the foundation of the world. Well, wait a minute. What about free will? What about free will? That's, loved ones, hear me on this. That's the amazing miracle of providence and sovereignty is that God can allow free will and still retain sovereignty over it. You're asking me to explain God to you? Really? You come to me and make, you think I'm going to make sense out of the mind of God? Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord. Why, why, can't, well, why can't some pastor answer the question? Well, there's some things that are just secrets. Move on, Todd. Move on. <laughs> next one, next one, next one. Government dysfunction abounds. Did you know that? Government dysfunction abounds. Verses 10 through 14. Government is established by God, but it's a human government, so there's dysfunction. First, Solomon points out that there is justice's duplicity. Those in the justice department, government department, have duplicity. Hypocrisy is rampant. Verse 10, then I saw the wicked buried. Well, that's a good thing, right? Well, no, that's not what he's talking about here. What's he saying here? He says, I saw the wicked buried. Well, in those days, if you had a burial, you, you, were, a, you were a good man, you were a good woman. The, the wicked people wouldn't be buried. They would just be thrown out into kind of a mass grave into a dump yard outside of a city. In fact, Jesus would have been thrown out onto this ash heap of bodies outside of Jerusalem if it wasn't for the rich man who stepped forward and says, you can bury him in my tomb. Why? Because the wicked people, they had no burial. So when, he, when, when Solomon says this, then I saw the wicked buried, he's like, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. Why are they, why are they being cared for and loved and praised? Why are they having a memorial funeral? What, what is this? They're being treated like a worthy person when they're wicked. Now notice this. He goes on. He says, they used to go in and out of the holy place and were praised in the city where they had done such things. This also is vanity. What's he saying here? These wicked officials, they attended church. They, you know, they, they rode the coattails of religion. But they were religious frauds. They were political frauds. They, they said, you have to do this, but we don't have to do that. You, you, you all put masks on, but at our parties, we don't. And make no mistake, it's on both sides of the aisle. When, when, when Trump's asked, hey, do you, have you asked for forgiveness of sin? And he says, I can't think of any reason I would need to ask for forgiveness. Let me just tell you what that is. That's anti-gospel. Let's call us, as Christians, call a strike when it's a strike. That, that's, that's hypocritical. What he's saying here is, man, there, there, this, there, there's this duplicity in their lives. Number two, justice is delayed. Justice is delayed. Boy, do, do we see this? Justice should be swift, but it's not. Even, even, in, even in our laws, we talk about swift justice, but man, it turns slowly today. Verse 11, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Why, why do you see rampant crime today? It's because nobody gets, nobody gets uh, called out on it. Nobody gets arrested. No, no, nobody, nobody is getting sentenced to anything. Remember, remember God's justice? Remember Ananias and Sapphira? <laughs> Everybody say, oh, the New Testament is full of grace. Have you read Acts? <laughs> oh, but Jesus is a, he's a kind guy. Have you read Revelation? Ananias and Sapphira, remember they, Ananias comes in to worship without his wife. I don't know why. She's running late. Makeup, I don't know. 
And he lies. Remember, just bottom line, he lies. And remember what happens right there while he's worshiping? He just drops dead. He gets taken out. Three hours later, his wife comes in. There's so much. That'll preach right there. But Sapphira comes in, and what does she do? She lies also, and guess what she does? She drops dead. You talk about swift justice. There's nobody swifter than the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can meet him as Savior or as judge. See, what, what, what's happening here is there's this rampant crime because everybody's doing what is right in their own eyes, and there's no evil, there's no prosecution. You have the Manhattan DA. His name is Alvin Bragg. He... He campaigned on what he called his day one memo. You know what his day one memo was? This was his campaign promise. His promise was simply this. His office would not seek jail time for most criminal conduct, including robbery, assault, and gun possession, unless there was an immediate, genuine risk of physical harm. It makes no sense whatsoever. Assault? Well, if you're not going to hurt him again... Let me tell you what that is. That's wickedness in the highest levels of government. That is duplicity. That is delayed justice. In fact, number three, it's justice denied. Verse 12, though a sinner does evil a hundred times. Boy, are we seeing that today? Have you seen some of the rap sheets that these, these, these criminals come out with? They got six, feet, six feet long full of rap sheet. hundred times? We see this all the time happening. hundred times and prolongs his life. He says this, yet I know, I know that, there, that it will be well with those who fear God because they fear before him, but it will not be well with the wicked. Neither will he prolong his days like a shadow because he does not fear before God. Loved ones, what, what Solomon's saying here is make no mistake, justice is being denied here on earth, but justice is not going to be denied ultimately. Justice will be brought to every zip code in America. The line of Judah will reign from this earth, and he will right every wrong. He will cross every T, dot every I, and every human of history will be held to account for what they did. That's just, the, that's just the gospel. And so what happens here is he says, yeah, it's denied. But number four, notice this, justice is distorted. Have you noticed this? That evil's rewarded and good is punished these days? He says, there is vanity that takes place on earth, that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. Good people being treated as evil people. And there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. Bad people being treated like they're good people. I said that this also is vanity. And it is. We see it, we see it all the time. We're, we're legislating sin. We're, we're, we're praising evil. We're praising wickedness today. Do you know in, in, the, in the valley here, Santa Cruz Valley, do you understand that an oak tree has more protection than a baby in a womb? Do, do you understand that? You know what that is? That's wickedness. That's wickedness. This is exactly what Solomon's talking about. What we have to understand is that government dysfunction abounds. So now I've taken you down to the depths. And you're already thinking, why on earth did we come to church today? I want to just close quickly with some hope. You need some hope? Look at the last point. Here's the hope. Government cannot control your attitude. Did you know that? Government can take a lot of things away from you, but they can't take Jesus and your attitude. Notice what, so Solomon has just told us everything he's just told us, right? Justice denied, delayed, distorted, duplicity. I mean, it's horrible, 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 horrible. Solomon, what should we do? Verse 15, and I commend joy. <laughs> People accuse me of finding humor where it's not. That's funny. <laughs> what does he say to us here in America? I commend joy. Why? For man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink, 
Be joyful, for this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given to him under the sun. What did we as Christ followers? We live with the hope of the world. We live with the hope of Christ. We live with heaven in front of us. Our best days are always in front of us. What do we do today? We, we, we eat, we drink, we're joyful. What is joy? Joy is not the giggles in life. Joy is the, is the, is the removal of fear. Joy is the fact that you have this deep down settled confidence that God is in control of every detail of my life. Therefore, I have joy. I, I know that this is all going to work out. I, I'm not worried about Biden's age. I know it's all going to be good. But we're, you know, we're running around, oh, you know, he's, he's so old, he might accidentally fall on the codes, the nuclear buttons. <laughs> hey, Christ follower, Christ follower, number one, we respect the office. N- number two, God's sovereign. God's sovereign. We live in a day where we're on the evening news for the first time since the 80s you hear talk of nuclear war. Have you noticed that? Not since the 80s have we heard the evening news talk about potential nuclear war. This takes me back even to the 70s when I was a kid in elementary school. Remember, for nuclear drills, you'd get under your desk? Some people think that the science on not wearing masks doesn't make sense. (laughs) Let me tell you, the science behind getting under your desk for a nuclear war does not make any sense whatsoever. But what do we do? We do this. We do this. We live our life because we live it it under the sovereign hand of God. You trust God. You trust that God knows everything when you know nothing. Look at verse 16. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on earth, how neither day or night do one's eyes see sleep, then I saw all the work of God that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. Man can't figure this out. However much, more, much, man, however much man may toil in seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know he cannot find it out. There's certain things Solomon keeps saying you can't find out. You just don't know. We just don't know. We think we know. All of us became all of us became scientists when it came to COVID. We all knew everything. And there's actually there's actually really good scientific people in that field. Men and women who love Jesus Christ who know things. But we all we all became the experts. What's he saying here? He's saying simply this. You're not the expert. You don't know everything. You just don't know everything. The king doesn't know everything. As Vance Harmer says this, I love this, God marks across some of our days these words. We'll explain later. (laughs) You know, we all like unsolved mysteries. We even have a show for it. We love mysteries. We love mystery books. There's whole sections in libraries and bookstores called Mystery. But when God has a mystery, we get upset. There's just certain things that are mysteries that you just don't know. I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why Russia and Ukraine are fighting. I don't know. But I know God knows. Well, what happens? What happens if we're pulled into it? I, I don't know. But I know God knows. John 13, 7. I love this verse. This is, this, some of you need to cling and claim this verse. Jesus is talking to Peter, and I love what he says in John 13, 7. He says this to Peter. What I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward, you will understand. That's, that's a good verse. You don't understand now, but afterward, you will understand. See, government can control and take a lot of things, but they can't take away Jesus Christ. They can't control our attitude. And our attitude is based on Psalm 95. Psalm 95, verses 3 and 4, for the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In His hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains. 
are also his. You understand that? The psalmist just declared that our God is so great, so big, that the depths and the heights of this world, this universe, is in his proverbial hands. Some of you are worried that things are out of control. Let me just tell you, everything is in his hands. We used to sing about this. He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 We believe that as kids. We need to believe it as adults. Father, we pray. We pray for the world in which we live. It is a it is a crazy time. The world continues to convulse. And Father, we're so thankful that you are not losing any sleep. That all of it, that things that we look at and we call chaos, it's all in your hands. And you call it according to plan. Father, give us, give us a sense of peace. Give us a sense of hope, trust. Drive us to the, the foot of the cross. We surrender our day, our situation to you. Father, help us, to, help us to sing that song to ourselves, to remind us of your sovereign hand. We love you, Lord. We trust you this morning. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Crossroads, as you leave, Davies is in the lobby. Kimmy uh, Iverson is heading back to the mission field tonight at 7 o'clock in Classroom A is going to be a dessert. If you know Kimmy, uh, come join us, as we say, and send her back onto the field. And then uh, right after service, as prayer counselors are here, if you're new to our church, Starting Point is out in the lobby. Please stop by Starting Point. We'd love to greet you. Otherwise, Crossroads, have a great week. Stay faithful. You're dismissed.